I'm Steve Goldman. I'm the director of the Center for Free Enterprise. And thank everybody for coming on the wrong day. Uh, but, you know, it was unfortunate what happened yesterday, but um, Jan Mee graciously agreed to stay here and talk, give her talk today, but unfortunately, she has to leave at 5.30 on the nose. So we're not gonna do quite the format we had planned. Um, she's just gonna talk and then we're gonna do some Q&A. So let me jump through all the stuff we have to say here. Um, this is the last event of the Menard Family Lecture Series for the Center for Free, for Free Enterprise. And we wanna thank the Menard Family Foundation for, for funding this, it's, it's great. And this event is also co-sponsored by the Young Americas Foundation. So we really wanna thank them for helping out here. Um, if you're here for cr class credit or reading group, participation, Cardinal Flight, there'll be a QR code at the, on the door when you leave. Fill it, take the picture, fill out the form, make sure you fill out all the information, say what class it's for and you'll get your credit. Otherwise you won't, I don't think. So one takeaway from today's talk might be that when governments compel citizens unjustly, their citizens are worse off. A system of government that gives its citizens greater freedom will have better outcomes in the things that people value. And this has been found in economic study after economic study. Less government, people are better off. And so think about these ideas today as you hear Yan Mi tell her story. And so we're fortunate to have a North Korean defector and human rights activist, Yan Mi Parker. She visited here in 2016. I think this was one of the first universities she came to. And, and so we're so happy to have her back. And um, given yesterday's weather, you know, we're fortunate that she decided to stay, but again, we're leaving right at 5.30 and don't talk to her, don't ask anything, I'm walking out with her. And, and I'm not even gonna say thank you for coming, so I'm gonna tell you now thank you for coming uh, because we really have to get out of here. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on her introduction because she's gonna tell you her story and it's much better than me telling it. Um, and I was gonna do some Q&A, but we're not. So what else? Uh, she's written two books, In Order to Live and While, while, time, still rema while time Remains. Both those books are on sale outside the door. She signed a few of them. So if you wanna buy one when you leave, you can. And um, thank you for coming. I hope you have a great end of your semester. We'll be doing this again in the fall. Have three events, so make sure you sh show up. If you wanna be in our reading group, sign up. You get an email at the beginning of the semester. Read your emails. Some people came yesterday because they didn't read the emails knowing that the school was closed. So um, read your emails. Anyhow, here's Yami Park. Thank you, Yami, for coming. <laughs> it's too loud. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh, I, I cannot believe it. I give a lot of these speeches, and I still get really, really nervous. And I try to my tell myself this story, which I say, well, even if you go up there, say something stupid, you're not going to be executed. <laughs> so get up there and tell your story. <laughs> That's uh, how I came up here today. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Yanmi Park. I was born in a country called Socialist Paradise, or also known for Hermit Kingdom. In the 21st century, North Koreans does not even know the existence of internet. And growing up in North Korea, I had to call you guys bastards. <laughs> that was a one word, American bastard. If we said Americans, that would be too polite. So we had to say that, that word. Even in my math class, I remember my teacher were asking me, there are four American bastards, you killed two of them. How many American bastards left to kill? That's how I learned my math, guys. <laughs> it's so surreal coming here, meeting you guys, and I feel like you guys have to be the kindest bastards in the whole world. <laughs> Growing up in North Korea, I had no idea that I was living in under oppression. In North Korea, of course, we expect there's a lot of scarcity. Scarcity of food, information, material goods, but there's also a lot of scarcity of a concept, ideas, like freedom, human rights, love. These concepts don't exist. How many of you guys read this book by George Orwell in 1984? You guys are smart, oh my god, <laughs> I'm impressed. 
So this book talks about who controls language. They control the thought, right? If you don't understand the word, that means you don't understand the concept. That's how the North Korean dictatorship eliminated such words like human rights. And you don't know the words, so how do you understand the concept? So I did not know. Growing up in North Korea, I thought I had everything in the world. I had literally nothing to envy. I had one older sister. I had two loving parents. But interestingly, every room that I entered in North Korea was had the portraits of my dear leaders, or Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il, and his mom, like Kim Jong Suk. And they say if the house cut catches fire, the first thing you need to protect is not your family's life, it's not your children's life, it's those portraits. If a little dust gathers on those portraits, middle of the night, police officers kick our door and then wipe it. If any dust gathered on those portraits, you get executed. The very first thing my mother taught me as a young girl was don't even whisper because birds and mice could hear me. She said the most dangerous thing I had in my body was my tongue. If I said one wrong word, it was not just going to kill me. It was going to kill three to eight generations, my family's life. So the examples of what gets you killed in North Korea, actually recently my uh, a friend was telling me, you should write a book about how 500 silly witch die in North Korea. <laughs> so every paper, newspaper in North Korea, first page has have the picture of the Kim dictators. If you didn't see the front page, you saw the back page, and you ripped the paper by mistake, you get killed for that, because of lack of loyalty. That's how silly crimes are. But Raping somebody, stealing somebody, robbing somebody is almost not a crime. Uh, growing up there, I did go to school part of time. And here, a lot of thinking, <coughs> it's a socialist system, right? Where supposedly everything should be free. It should be a free education. It should be free health care. It should be free of public ration. But turns out, nothing was free. Kim Jong-il when I was a child growing up in the northern part of North Korea, I remember going outside of my home, I was looking at dead bodies like I look at trees right now in America. Millions, millions of died in North Korea from malnutrition. And this malnutrition was man-made by the dictator. When the officials went to Pyongyang as a dictator, dear leader, there are millions of North Koreans dying right now because of malnutrition, what shall we do? Kim Jong-il said this to them. It's easy to do socialism when there are less of them. The very call of socialism and North Korean regime is anti-human. And it breaks my heart living in America. I hear these things too. They say humans are poison. We are the poison to the Mother Earth that we are, humans are almost bad. Just like that, the regime does not respect human dignity. And that's why we are dying, because we are just too many for the government to control. So he wanted us to die. That's why we are dying. Uh, but in this darkness, still, there is a moment where I taste of freedom and humanity. It is when I watched bootleg DVD from black market. In North Korea, watching unauthorized movies by the government can get you killed. But a lot of people do risk their lives watching these movies to learn about the outside world. The first thing that I saw that was not government <laughs> made in North Korea was WWE Pro Wrestling. <laughs> Have you guys seen this movie? I mean, I just show, right? Um, when I was watching it, I was like, I did not know that was a show. I thought that's how average American men looked like, you know? <laughs> so when I came to America, I was like, what happened to your men? 
This is not what I expected. <laughs> and after this show, I watched another movie. This was actually a movie. It's called Titanic. Have you seen movie Titanic, guys? Yes. Watching this movie, I remember first time as a young girl, I was so confused. Because in North Korea, we don't have a Romeo and Juliet. Love story between human is a, such a shameful story that nobody talks about. There is no word even for romance. And in the movie, this guy doesn't die for the revolution. He dies for some girl. And I was so confused. And I was thinking, maybe this guy got executed from uh, making this movie. I was really worried about DiCaprio. So <laughs> when I got out, first thing I made sure was he was alive. And people said, he's very much alive, dating hot young models. <laughs> and that's when my interest in him stopped. <laughs> I don't care what happened to him now. But in this movie, <laughs> as silly as it sounds, it opened something in me. The possibility of life can be different. Life can be just more than being a revolutionary f for the you know, Communist Party and our, our dear leader. It could be for loving somebody else. It could be sacrifice for something else other than the government. I still had no idea the world was like this. And by the time when I was 13 years old, uh, we could not simply find anything to eat. And right now, it's a spring. And spring is always a, when I was in North Korea, spring is called, in North Korea, it's like season of death. Because we don't have enough bugs right now. There are not enough plants. And this is most of people die from starvation. And that's why I escaped in spring, end of March, March 20, I think 6th in 2007. Uh, growing up in North Korea, I ate lots of bugs, like grasshoppers, dragonflies, even some little ants, <laughs> lots of grass, and don't look at me that way, it's great for losing weight. <laughs> and even in America, I hear a lot of these stories where we need to eat bugs to save Earth. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to eat my steak. <laughs> I ate enough of my portion of bugs, you know? Uh, but by the 13, my family had to find a way because we were going to die from starvation like everybody else. Luckily, we were living on the border town of North Korea, the city called Hesan. And how many of you see the, seen the picture of the satellite picture of North Korea at nighttime? Right, it is literally the darkest place in the world because they don't have electricity at nighttime. And in that darkness, at night time, when I looked up across the river, I saw lights, I saw the electricity, I saw paved roads where the cars are running by. And that's when I thought, if I go where those lights are, I might find a bowl of rice. It wasn't dreaming of freedom, it wasn't dreaming of life like this. It was simply thinking, maybe if I go where the lights are, I might get fed. So that's how I decided to risk my life to escape from North Korea at 13. I initially wanted to escape with my own sister, who was 16 years old, but I got really sick. So my parents took me to a hospital. And my sister had to escape without me, with her friend first. In the hospital, I remember, this is a, my last few days in that country. Doctors just rubbed my belly. There are no x-ray machines or CT scans. He thought I had appendicitis. So he said, we have to open her up this afternoon. It might burst and she died. So they opened my stomach without a, any painkiller that afternoon. And what they realized I had was infection <laughs> and malnutrition and fever. So doctors still got very embarrassed. So they still cut my appendix out and then, you know, stash me back up. And then when I got to the room, I had to go use a bathroom outside of my hospital, right? In North Korea, we don't have these like fancy indoor bathrooms. On my walk to this bathroom, there 
tired of human bodies, but it's not my first time seeing dead people. But what was unique about these people was their eyes were all hollow. They didn't all have eyes. So I asked my mom, like, mom, why don't they have eyes? And the reason they didn't have eyes were because eyes are the soft tissue in our body. When we die, rats eat our eyes first. And then you see children next to these rats and trying to catch these rats. And those children are like my son's age right now. I, I have a son who's six years old. And these, these rats carry a lot of disease. So when you eat these rats, you die. When you die, these rats eat these children back. So this cycle continues every spring in North Korea. That's when I thought, no matter what, I'm going to escape from this country. After I got discharged from hospital, uh, I found a little note where my older sister left me. She said, go find this lady. She might help you to go to China and find me. I took my mother with me, and we found the lady. And for some reason, she said, I can help you to go to China and find your sister. I didn't question her why she was going to help me for free. And she found a broker, helped me to cross. Uh, crossing North Korean border is considered to be one of the most dangerous border to cross because there are landmines buried. There are machine guns with the guards every 10 meters have an order to shoot anybody who crosses. But the, luckily, this lady who was helping me bribed the border guards. So I was able to cross this frozen river into China with my mother. <coughs> oh, when I got to China, it was March 26, 2007. I was 13 and a half. The first thing I heard was this man who was in his 50s, I don't know, he said to my mom, I want to have sex with her. At the time, <laughs> I did not know the word sex because in North Korea, there's no sex education. And then my mom begged him. She just had a surgery. I was not even 50 pounds at the time. I was like half of my size right now. She's a child. Can you take me instead? So she protected me, and he raped her right in front of me. After this rape ended, they took us to another house. This time it's indoor. And then indoor, they were started like checking my teeth and checking my body, and then started negotiating our price. And I was so confused. Like, I'm not a little puppy. Why are you negotiating price on me? The reason why they were doing that is because they were selling us like sex toys in China. So a lot of you know China had one child policy, right, until recently. This policy made a lot of Chinese people to abort the girls and then kept the boys. So now in China, there are 33 million men cannot find wives. So there are human traffickers, buy girls like us, and then sell us to this man. So they came down to price for my mom was $65. And then, surprisingly, they said I was worth more than $200 at the time. The reason I was more expensive than my mom is because some men in China like to take child virginity away. They are willing to give money for child virginity. That's how they sold me for over $200. And I was separate from my mom. I was sold to another trafficker. It's like there's a trafficker rings, right? It, every time you go, your price goes up. And the guy this time who bought me is a Han Chinese. And of course, he's trying to rape me. And at this point, I want to kill myself because I lost everything. I lost my family. I lost anybody that I knew. And now I was going to be just a sex toy for a man. 
What was the reason for me to be alive? When I was trying to kill myself, this man who bought me made me an offer. He said, if you do become my mistress, I'm going to help you to buy your mom and find your family to you. So do you want to take this offer? And I thought, if I sacrifice myself, I can help my family. So I became his sex toy at 13. With so miracle, this man did not have to keep his promise. He did keep his promise, bought my mom back from a farmer that he sold, and he brought my sick father from North Korea. Uh, but at the time, we couldn't find my sister in China still. Uh, after less than six months later, my father died because he had a cancer from prison camp. And then this man would let me go. But in, in China, in, as a North Korean, you are running away from authority. The Chinese authority catch North Korean defectors and then send us back to North Korea, even though we get tortured and get killed when we go back. It's like during the World War II, catching Jews and sending them to Auschwitz. Exact same thing that they are doing. But even this man lets me go, where do I go in China? Without the government paper, I cannot even wash dishes. I cannot even work as a physical laborer. Nobody would give me a job. The only place I could go where I would not get raped is some place called chat rooms. These chat rooms where people give us a place to sleep and they feed us, but for that, we have to chat with men and show our bodies. For me, at the time I was 15, I thought, at least here I don't get raped physically by a man. At least here, I can just chat with them and show them my body. And that was 2009. In this chat room, <laughs> luckily, the customers, the men I was supposed to show my body and talk to are Ch South Korean men. And I was thinking, I thought South Korea was colonized by America and it was a corrupt capitalist society where people are suffering. And then these men looked so well off, they even had the money to spare like girls like me and seeing my body. And then a woman that we met in this chat room, she said, oh, I met there are some Christian missionaries coming from South Korea, rescuing defectors. Do you want to talk to them? I did not know what missionaries were, but I said there's a, they could help us, so I called this person on the phone. And this person said, there's a way out. You can go to South Korea, you can be free, and you can be safe. And at the time, at 15, I've never heard the word free. So I'm like, I never knew the definition of freedom. So I asked this lady, what do you mean that I'm going to be free in South Korea? Like, how would you explain freedom to a North Korean person right now? She did a perfect job. She said, sweetie, if you go to South Korea, you can wear jeans and you can watch K-dramas. <laughs> and nobody going to arrest you for that. <laughs> and I was like, I couldn't believe it. Where there is a country, people have a right to what to wear and what to watch. I said, I'm going to risk my life for that. So how can I go to South Korea? And turns out the plan was we had to walk across Gobi Desert from China to Mongolia in minus 40 degrees without the guide. So we had to pray a lot. And these missionaries gave us a campus. It was too uh, a compass. It was too dead. Just they could not come with us. They said, why don't you follow the north and the east or the west direction? Then if you cross 8 to 16 wider fences, it might be Mongolia. And if you meet Mongolian border guards, tell them that you're refugees, you want to go to South Korea. Oh, chance of making this journey is not even 1%. Do you know how many North Koreans made it to freedom in America over the last 80 years. 
over the last 80 years, guys, only 209 of us made this journey through. And I was one of them. Desert in the minus 40 degrees, I didn't die from the cold or die from the starvation. Somehow, miraculously, I survived, arrived in Mongolia, caught by the Mongolian guards, and they sent me to South Korea. Be free, finally. When I got to South Korea, I remember first day at the Incheon airport. I don't know how many guys been to Incheon airport. When I went to the bathroom, I remember, like, I thought I had to wash my hands in the toilet. I've never seen such a toilet. And there's this, like, toilet paper. Have such a nice scent. I store some toilet paper in my tummy. <laughs> and I landed, not even in a different country, in a new planet. But in new planet, in this nice country, I learned about freedom. And turns out, freedom was not just only wearing jeans and watch, watch K-dramas. It was way more complicated than I thought. Afterwards, being in Korea for five years, I learned a country, America. And I learned that Americans are not bastards. <laughs> they are kind, lovely people living under democracy. And America is the land of opportunity, home of the brave, and there's a liberty in this country. And I thought, maybe I want to go there. Maybe I want to go there study. And that dream came true. In 2016, January, I accepted to Columbia University to study there as an undergrad ma major. And that's when I came actually eight years ago to this campus, guys. <laughs> uh, with so much full of hope, I went to Columbia. The very first day, it's not even like a class, as you guys do the orientation the first week, right, when you enter university. I had the orientation. My, the instructor were asking us, stay angry, stay outraged, because America is systemically evil. This country needs to be destroyed, dismantled, and got to be rebuilt in the name of equity, which means socialism. And I was thinking, like, are you a psychopath? <laughs> Have you been outside the world of, out of the US? They are literally human beings are sold for less than $100. In China, being sold as a sex slave is kind of a best thing that could happen to me because other places that buy North Korean girls are the places where organ harvesters. They buy our body, wait for the order, they take our fresh organ out and deliver it and discard our body. After all, we don't even cost as much as one iPhone in their hand. This is happening in the 21st century, and this is what's happening at Columbia. And my classmates, they're literally having their MacBook in their hands, and their Lululemon yoga pants, on their green juice detox. Did you guys know that? It's so 10 bucks per bottle. They tr their problems are having too much calorie. They try to burn that calorie and telling me they're oppressed. I'm like, you, if you're actually oppressed, you would not know you're oppressed. <laughs> not knowing is the actual definition of oppression. And they say, America is evil. And I asked them one day, why do you hate America so much? And they said, look out. There are billionaires, because New York has a lot of billionaires, and there are homeless people. This system creates inequality. Therefore, this system needs to be dismantled. No offense, but as a North Korean, my first reaction is like, what do you mean homeless? You have not, you have right not to work? Do you know what happens in socialist actual North Korea if you decide not to work and chill on the street? They're gonna capture you, they're gonna torture you, they're gonna send you work camp. And I was like, the fact these people can be homeless seems to me as a North Korean also a sign of 
freedom. They have right not to do anything. And they say, nobody makes billion dollars. They take billion dollars. And I was thinking, so you are really telling me that Steve Jobs came to you and then robbed your money. You didn't go voluntarily buy your iPhone and MacBook. You are really telling me Elon Musk was building rockets and electric car. They, you think he stole your money? And they say, why well, you are brainwashed? <laughs> well, I heard that a lot of times in my life. And this gonna make you guys really, really mad right now. But one day the professor was saying, science is made up and even math is made up by white men to control minority. And I was thinking, they say math is racist. Like, well, that's what I heard in North Korean classroom. One day in my North Korean classroom, my teacher asked me, what is one plus one? What is one plus one, guys? Thank God you know the answer. <laughs> Very confident. A lot of people don't know that these days. And I said two, and my teacher said, wrong. Think about it. If you add one drop of water to another drop of water, what does it become? Yeah, it becomes bigger one. Therefore, my dear little Kim Jong-il discovered that math is made up by white people to control minority. Math is made up. At an Ivy League campus, my classmates were learning exact same things that North Korean teachers taught us in the classroom. And one day in senior uh, feminine class, I was almost graduating, uh, my professor said, you know, literally there's no difference between men and women. Anybody can be man, anybody can become woman. And literally before every class we had to say our, before our names or what my major is, they say, talk us about your pronouns. And by the way, guys, do you know how I learned English? I watched TV show Friends in 2014 to learn English. In Friends, they did not have a Z, X, Y pronouns. <laughs> they did not get the note, and I did not learn that in my grammar books either. So I came to Colombia. Of course, I did not know how to use these pronouns in my sentences. Not with bad feelings, I just did not know. I felt like grammatically incorrect because that's not how I learned. And whenever I said the wrong pronouns, my classmates would come in their tears telling me how I make them feel unsafe and how they feel so oppressed. And I was thinking, you poor thing. Do you really think this is a problem? There is actual life and death situation in life, but this cannot be it. That is also when I realized with the good intentions, North Korea began. With the intention of equality of outcomes. Nobody's richer, nobody's poorer. Every has an equal opportunity, equal outcome, equal amount of wealth, equal amount of education. They began with this equality of outcomes, equity idea. And in America, I see also so many people with good intentions are chewing choosing in a similar path that I saw in North Korea that gone terribly wrong. Uh, now, eight years ago, I came here. I did not know about these things. And nobody called me racist. Nobody called me CIA spy. And now I'm every one of those. <laughs> and interestingly, I just wanted this my last point. I became American two years ago, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I was, I mean, literally beca becoming American is better than winning 10 lotteries combined. It's the best thing, the greatest thing in the whole world. I was so proud. Uh, but that week, in the same week that I was becoming in a citizen, you know, foreigners, when they become citizens, they have to take the citizenship test. Uh, that week, I was canceled by FBI. I was invited to speak at FBI Dallas. And the one week before my speech, the head of diversity, did you know that? At FBI, it's a job, called me, 
we need to cancel your talk because of your political opinions. I was thinking, am I not diverse enough for you? <laughs> There's only 200 of us in the country. I might be the most diverse person you can ever bring to FBI <laughs> to tell a story. But no, my, my political opinions was a problem for this per, for these people. But then, in my inter, like citizenship test, my interviewer asking me, "Have you ever persecuted anybody for their political opinion?" If I said yes, I would not be an American. Do you know, as an American, you cannot persecute anybody for their political opinions? It's a very un-American thing to do. And this very un-American behavior is committed by American federal agencies like FBI. So many people in America don't know what it means to be American, what it means to be a citizen of a free nation. Now, I live in New York. My district is represented by AOC. What an irony. <laughs> and I love that. Socialists thrive in America. Bernie Sanders, AOC, so many socialists thrive in this country because it should be diverse. We should have communists. We should have all diversified ideas in the country. That's the point of living in a free society. In North Korea, if you're a capitalist, you're going to be executed. That's why American system is better, in my opinion. But so many people right now in this country are divided for no reason. And I want to really tell you why this is dangerous, the division. In North Korea, everybody is divided. As I said, literally mice and birds could be a spy. Literally, everybody is spying on you. You cannot trust your neighbors. You cannot even trust your own children or family. Everybody can report on you. And when people are divided, that means our people are powerless. It's a perfect opportunity for a dictatorship to rise. And even though you might have disagreed with everything I said, I'm sure we care about humanity. We agree on more things than we actually acknowledge. There's no reason to hate each other because somebody is not a communist. <laughs> and that's why it breaks my heart. When I spoke at TED in Vancouver, it was like all the tech CEOs in the world coming and they say, OK, where are you going after this? Like, I'm going to speak at one of the universities in Texas. They say, I've never set a foot in a Trump country the state that voted Trump. And I'm like, do you think those are not American people? <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. I'm not asking you to agree everything I said here. I might even change my mind in 10 years. I might become a socialist, who knows? But we are a free country. I have to, I have a right to be wrong, and also I have a right to change my mind. That shouldn't be the reason why we are canceling each other, why we are being divided, and continuing in this path of, I don't even know what to call right now in America. And that's why I am extremely grateful for all of you are putting up with me, putting up with my story, and giving me this platform to share my ideas and my story. Thank you so much, everyone, and I look forward to our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have Q&A, guys. <laughs> um, so some people have said you're a spokesperson for the right. Yeah. Because some of the message tends to be that way. And they wonder if you've been indoctrinated. And then I wonder when they ask that question, have they been indoctrinated? <laughs> right? And so you know, can, does it go both ways there, or not at all? Or what do you think? Uh, that's a real good question. Uh, I'm sure none of us think we are brainwashed, right? That's the point of brainwashing. <laughs> um, in some sense, I was the biggest critic of President Trump when he was meeting Kim Jong-un. I was on the front of New York Times criticizing him. And now, 
because I'm criticizing the woke, I'm brainwashed. At the time, they did not think I was brainwashed to criticize Trump. <laughs> so, so if I was not like brainwashed then, how am I brainwashed now? <laughs> so that's very interesting. And yeah, I really think in some sense, I keep saying like even North Korea didn't go this far. At least in North Korea, <laughs> I know a lot of you gotta be very mad at me. At least in North Korea, we still know that women are women and men are women. And so much things in America became controversial that I censor myself. And I hate myself for that because that's how dictatorship begins. When you fear what you say, when you censor what you say. And I, 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 when I came to America, guys, a lot of people asked me like, so why there is no revolution inside North Korea? Are you guys stupid? Why do you not rise up and like fight for your rights? And I was saying, so far in North Korea, if you stand up, it, they kill eight generations of your family. In America, so far, if you speak your mind fully without censoring, you might lose your job, called as a transphobic, racist, all of that. And with that little consequences, I see that a lot of Amer Americans are censoring themselves. That's why it's really hard to rise up when there's such a <laughs> persecution exists for you. Hello. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, knowing the things that you do now and having the interest you do now, um, if you could do your education over again, if you could study whatever you want to, is there something that you would major in or an area of study that you would concentrate on now? Oh, first thing, I would not go to Colombia again. <laughs> I would not send my son again there, for sure. Uh, I think, it's, for me, education is self-learning. <laughs> Even when you go to university, if you don't do the readings and all of that, you still don't learn much, right? So, uh, if I, I think learning is a life journey. I still have a lot to learn, and I still read a lot of books and meet people, ask questions, and come to you guys here about your ideas. So every day is a opportunity to learn. I think that's how I see it. Not learning shouldn't be just always in the classrooms. It should be everywhere we go. And yeah, but I have no intention of trusting Ivy League institutions to do a good job when it comes to helping people, teach them how to think. It's literally a place to learn what to think. At this point, I believe in them, they might change someday. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> um, so based on your experiences, is there anything you think people like us can do to address the problem of government overreach? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's a, such a, I think one thing I really ask about American people is that there are two types of dictatorships, guys. One is a physical dictatorship that we all know government controls what you wear, what you see, where you go. Second dictatorship is called a dictatorship of the mind, the mind control. And now American government already are siding with the mainstream media, what narratives are allowed or what not. The social media companies until the X, right? I was censored on all other platforms. So if the government owns the reality, if the government own the truth, that is literally, there is, that dictatorship is hard to avoid. It's a lot easier to free your physical body than free your mind. And I think that's why I advocate for the media that is not biased. It's media shouldn't be biased in any way. It's not good for democracy, it's good for anybody. So, I think we need to watch out in every sense. I think we need to keep them in check. And I think that's our duty as citizens living in this free country. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, one, just want to say thank you so much for speaking today. Uh, your story is truly inspiring. And two, you're really knowledgeable of North Korea. My question is, do you think we'll see regime change in our lifetime? North Korea's future is 100% dependent on Chinese Communist Party's future. Kim Jong-un does not exist by himself. Entire his 
budget, everything is dependent on CCP. CCP in a way runs North Korea. That's why you guys don't hear about, like I met so many American people, like government people like Hillary Clinton, <laughs> the business leaders, right? And American, like Michelle Obama had no problem with talking about girls who were captured by Boko Haram or ISIS. Why there's not one single celebrity, not one single politician are talking about there are 300,000 North Korean girls are sold in China. It's because Chinese influence in America. And because of that, we don't understand who is actually accountable for this genocide, which is CCP. So as long as CCP continues this direction, nothing will change in North Korea. There's really nothing can be done. So only way we can change the North Korean issue is through CCP, but the only country can combat against China is America because you know, they're the second the greatest economy and America has that power and it's so sad. America does not stand up for their principles at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, have you read the book, Without You There Is No Us? Yes, yeah. Okay, so I, it, it's about a New York Times um, reporter who goes down and she goes and teaches English as a second language which Im to elite students. So I was wondering, could you comment on the education system in, in North Korea? Is it really two-tiered? Yeah, so as you guys just said, like the, there's no us, like what was the title again for your title? Well, I could be wrong, but I thought yeah. it was, Without you, there is no us. Right, so without you, dear leader, there's no us. That means like our life depends on dictator. So just like that, you know, if you're elite in North Korea, you go get education in Switzerland, <laughs> like Kim Jong-un. And if you are in the bottom, you don't even see the map of the world. So I wanna talk about North Korea's caste system. The country that founded the idea of complete equality of outcomes, they divided people into 51 different classes. And North Korea is unlike America, there are no racial barriers, nothing. Homogeneous country, speak same language, everybody look the same. So how on earth would you divide people 51 different classes? Do you know what they did? Kim Il-sung came up with the idea. We are gonna divide people based on what their ancestors did. Does it mean anything? If your ancestor owned a slave, you are responsible for their crimes. In America nowadays, the narrative is like that. So in North Korea, the same thing. If your grandfather was a landowner, your blood is like, tainted. Your genetics is oppressive. You are in the raw ranking. And there's no way you can get out of that Songbun, the caste system. So three categories we say, top third of the class called tomatoes. You're red inside, you're red outside. There, therefore, there's no doubt that you believe in socialism. Second, the middle third class is called the apples. You are red outside, but you're white inside. You're suspicious. You need government surveillance. The last one, you're grape. You're not even red outside. <laughs> you're completely screwed. You are something called the hostile class. These classes are usually, they had the grandparents who were educators, or the capitalists like own the business, or landowners, or who oppose communist revolution. That top third class called the hostile class, they need to, to be persecuted generation after generation. There's no ending to that persecution. So that's how North Korean society operates. And based on your class, your status in the society, they determine who can go to college, who can receive education, and what education you receive. And that's how everybody gets a different kind of education in the country. Okay. Yes, you for you. Hello, uh -huh. Hello. thank you very Hello. much for sharing your story. My name is Keba. I have one question for you. How do you think uh, your story can help uh, bridge cultural gaps between people of different backgrounds? Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, one thing I, that I hope my story can do is prove to the people that who question American system. Um, I still feel 
unbelievably don't deserving this kind of stage because after all, my worth was not even $300. A former sex slave can come to this country alone, no mom, no dad, no education, learn the English from watching some soap opera, <laughs> come here, can write two books, can give lectures at a university. I'm sure a lot can be fixed in America, but this system is still tolerant to people like me and too many other immigrants who suffered. And that's why I hope we preserve this country, we can make it better, but we don't need to tear it down, I think. If you want to just tear it down, go to North Korea. You get what you need. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go ahead. It's nice to meet you. My question is, would you be my friend? Absolutely. I think it be, <laughs> I, and then I have one more question as well. Obviously, I wanted you to be my friend, but where does your hope come from? Does it come from God? Where do you find your hope in your darkest moments? Oh, uh, my son. <laughs> I'm, as I said, my mother. And my father told me in the darkest moment that he said, life is gift no matter what. No matter where you are in life, life is a gift. You need to appreciate it. You have to fight for life. And I think that every life is precious. And I don't think anything is better than fighting for life. I, I'm a human rights activist. I met so many other activists who fight for dolphins, for little puppies, <laughs> uh, climate change. I work at the UN with meeting these people. None of them get this question. Only me, as a human rights activist, they get this question, they say, so tell me, why do I have to care about human rights? And I'm like, do you, like, are you not a human being or something? <laughs> do you think literally dolphins gonna fight for human rights? Do you think puppies gonna do it? Who's gonna fight for human rights other than us? And the fact, when I was heard about the animals' rights in the beginning, I was really offended. I was like, there are billions of people don't know they have rights as a human being, and you guys care about little puppies. And now I finally understood why we care about little puppies. Because puppies does not have a voice. They cannot speak for themselves. That's why we care about human rights, puppies' rights. And when there are four billion people right now have no voice and cannot speak for themselves, and that's how I believe it's our duty to be the voice for the voiceless and speak for those people. So when we are not free, when we don't have voice, hopefully they do the same for us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>